Carlos, all yours. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm Carlos Blanco. I'm going to be the chair of this uh, panel, last panel today. Um, I'm going to present Professor Tom Kunz. He is professor of biology and director of the Center for Ecology and Conservation here at BU. He is a specialist in conservation biology of bats, and uh, he has conducted uh, field research in many countries, including the United States, and he is a founding co-director of the Tiputini Biodiversity Station in Eastern Ecuador. Professor Kunz. Thank you, uh, Scott and Carlos and Otto, for inviting me to give this presentation. As I mentioned to Scott a little while ago, I sort of feel like a fish out of water among all of the social scientists here. Uh, but hopefully what I have to say uh, will differ somewhat. Uh, and part of the difference I see in listening to what many of you have said today is the, the temporal and spatial scales when we're dealing with the environment are so much different than they are in the social sciences. We're talking about not decades or day, weeks or years, but we're talking about thousands of years and millennia when it takes for the time it takes for a species to evolve and but yet on the other hand given the current developmental challenges that this planet is facing today extinctions can occur very rapidly and in fact we're seeing this already uh, within the last uh, 20 years uh, I'll just give one example uh, of all the frog species in the world 60 species have gone extinct from a fungus that has attacked and, and killed these. And this is just the tip of the iceberg as far as extinctions that occur. We're, we're living in the era of the next massive extinction. We're in the sixth era of the sixth extinction. The last major extinction on Earth occurred 65 million years ago. But we're now facing, because of anthropogenic changes from global climate change to pollution to invasive species to and, uh, emerging diseases, we're now experiencing uh, an enormous change in our environment. Now, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, uh, really a case study uh, of uh, what we have accomplished here at BU uh, to try to address the issues of environmental degradation and to try to educate a, a new cadre of people, uh, both here and in, in this case, Ecuador. I'm going to focus on that one country, but you can certainly use that kind of knowledge and the sort of paradigm for this uh, for many other countries. And, and in fact, it's not novel, but it's something we feel very um, passionate about. So just for all of you, uh, some of you anyway, uh, who are not familiar with some of the terminology here when we're talking about biodiversity ecosystems and ecosystem services. So biodiversity, or also known as biological diversity, is the scientific term used to depict the variety of life on Earth. And an ecosystem is characterized by its collection of species, the physical environment in which they live, and the sum total of their interactions with each other and their shared environments. Ecosystem services are the goods and services that sustain all of life on this planet, including human life. So the ecosystem services, there are often four that we define in, in ways that uh, are very obvious to all of you. Provisioning services, such as food, fiber, I said food again twice here. It's actually food, uh, food fiber, and, and uh, medicines. Um, regulating services such as purifying water, mitigating floods, and detoxifying soils. Cultural services that meet our aesthetic and spiritual and intellectual needs. And supporting services which make it possible for all other ecosystem services such as pollination, seed dispersal, nutrient cycling, and primary production. These services have evolved over millions of years, and we're losing them rapidly. And, and from an economic perspective, if you try to factor in what, what are the losses that we can in, would, would incur if you lose pollination services. We've already seen this happen with the collapse of honeybees, the colony collapse. Uh, what we're now doing is importing other bees, moving them around the country because we don't have enough pollinators to sustain some aspects of agriculture. So this case study that I'm going to talk about here that focuses on biodiversity and ecosystem services, 
uh, I've titled When Dreams Converge. And dreams converge here, uh, and that is from Boston University to Ecuador, uh, where several years ago, uh, I, along with others from uh, Ecuador, uh, established an international collaboration, and again, I think this can be a model for many other countries. Um, it was established through the center, which I happen to be the director of, the Center for Ecology and Conservation Biology. It's an international research and training program, operates a semester-long field-based undergraduate and graduate program in Ecuador. It also supports a large number of research opportunities for uh, uh, colleagues, scientists uh, throughout the world, uh, geographers, ecologists, uh, behaviorists, uh, political scientists, and so on. So from the biological pers perspective, this center, the research and training, again, sort of spans the gap from looking at genes to ecosystems. So it's a wide range uh, of topics. Uh, researchers, I say, from all over the world get involved in interdisciplinary research and training. Uh, much of this is a way to engage the Ecuadorians who, are, who don't have access to many of these resources. We've tried to build capacity uh, by encouraging Ecuadorian students who not would not otherwise have opportunities to do these sorts of things. Here at BU, we have a number of affiliated programs. They're not all listed. Uh, uh, these are primarily uh, more science-based here, uh, but uh, we have a bioinformatics program, biostatistics, uh, our tropical ecology program, uh, the Division of International Programs, the Marine Program, Center for Biodynamics, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of different, and certainly the Center for Latin American Studies should have been on here, David, or Scott, but uh, it didn't get on there. So anyway, so why Ecuador? Well, Ecuador those of you who have been there, it's a small country relative to the size of South America, but it's incredibly diverse, both topographically and environmentally. Uh, the elevation from sea level up to uh, 5,800 meters to the various kinds of terrestrial environments from deserts to lowland rainforests, aquatic environments from meandering rivers to coastal wetlands. Our research program at the Center for Ecology and Conservation Biology just doesn't focus on uh, uh, South America. As you can see, these various dots, colleagues there's, uh, participate as uh, uh, center uh, associates, uh, spend their research in different parts of the world. Uh, I, I point out the three areas in, in blue here, uh, areas in in um, Ecuador that we um, have research on, ongoing research going. Throughout the world, however, we're really talking about what are called biodiversity hotspots. These are areas where there's the most species-rich areas on Earth, as documented by a, not just our group, but a wide range of, of scientists. In Ecuador alone, um, it is a, one of the biodiversity hotspots. It is the biodiversity hotspot in South America, <coughs> as we know it today. Over 2,000 species of freshwater fish. Think of these now as sometimes food, sometimes fiber, sometimes uh, uh, resources that humans use for medicine and so on. 680 species of amphibians and reptiles, many of those are declining, as I pointed out, uh, over 1,400 species of birds. Some of these involve cultural uh, as well as uh, economic, have economic value, 230 species of mammals, some of which provide food uh, and also <laughs> seed dispersal and pollination services, 20,000 species of flowering plants, which many of which provide us food and fiber, uh, and thousands of invertebrates that we really don't even know. We probably only know about, in, in fact, about 10% of the invertebrate life on Earth has even been documented. Uh, and then untold numbers of fungi and microbes, many of which are pathogens and or potential pathogens, uh, especially as we begin to grow through development, we begin to grow uh, monocultures such as soy and other uh, uh, plant products. Last December, we published a paper uh, in uh, what is known PLOS One, the Public Library of Science, uh, and this reports the diet. Uh, uh, or report documents Ecuador's Yasuni National Park. This is a, uh, the Yasuni Biosphere Reserve in which the Tiputini Biodiversity Station, which is what our center uh, co-developed with uh, Universidad San Francisco de Quito, it is the most species-rich area anywhere in uh, South America. 
And this is a, I was very happy to be a part of this program, uh, this particular paper uh, that uh, has gotten a lot of attention and uh, I won't belabor that at this point, but the dreams came about, uh, again, there's, these are the dreamers from the two worlds. There are two Ecuadorians here, actually one is a, is a gringo who became an Ecuadorian on the far le lower left there. He, he spent a Fulbright in Ec Ecuador and married an Ecuadorian woman and Carlos Montufer, which is here in the far uh, back right, and then uh, myself and Tim Perkins, who used to be head of the uh, International Programs Office here at BU back uh, in 1994 when we first started this whole program. Universidad, uh, Universidad San Francisco is a relatively new university, started in the, in the early 90s. Uh, it is the university that we have uh, paired with in order to develop these programs, uh, and this collaboration has been extremely successful. We're very happy with what's happened. The beginning of the dream, dream, dream came about uh, by trying to find a place to put this station on a small river, uh, the Tiputini River, uh, back in 1995, and I could tell long stories about meeting this, and this guy down here in the right, uh, uh, Mumbai, met us on the river with a spear about 15 feet long and said, uh, this is my river, you have to ask before you come down it. So. Okay, so the dream was realized. Okay, we developed a semester-long program in ecology, tropical ecology. Students spend a semester in Ecuador, um, and they spend a month in the rainforest, a month in the Andes, a month on the coast, and eight days in the, in the Galapagos Islands. It's one of the most wonderful programs. Students come back and tell us that they learn more in that one semester than they've learned the previous three years they've been here at BU. And that's probably true and everywhere. But the semester long work, it's a field-based program. It's, it's for undergraduates and graduate students to learn hands-on research. The field sites are just located here in, the, in this map in the Ecuador from the Montane Coastal and Rainforest site. Uh, the, the route to get there is not trivial. It takes about a, a day to get there by ra river and boat and airplane, airplane first, then boat, then river, the final leg of the Tiputini River. We built a field station with support of monies from BU and from Universidad San Francisco. I'll call it USFQ from now on. To, keep going here, and also support from the National Science Foundation, which provided uh, the, uh, a good support recently to upgrade our facilities. Uh, this is our first laboratory in the early years from 96 to 206, and in that short period of time, the termites carried the wooden building off. We now have a, a building made of fiberglass, steel, and, and uh, um, tile, and I don't think the termites are going to walk away. These are the, the early days of the student housing, et cetera, and I won't go into the details and so on. There are about uh, 45 kilometers of trails that have been developed. Uh, this is in part collaborating with our own, our own students go there and do service. We also have Ecuadorian students come there from USFQ as well as other trained, uh, untrained. We hire uh, indigenous people to help build these trails. Uh, some of the the bridges, the trails need to be constantly uh, uh, maintained. We built canopy towers to get access to the canopy. You may not know this, but 80% of the fauna and flora in the tropics is in the canopy. And, and this is what is really remarkable about this place. These, are, these towers are about 130 feet tall, uh, built around uh, silk cotton trees. This is a view from the top sunrise view of one of the canopy towers. Uh, Another view, um, a, a worm's eye view of, of how to get up on that canopy walkway. Uh, this is a, 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 what we call a white knuckle climb uh, up on this site. Uh, you can study these animals and plants and so on that you wouldn't ever see or, or contact uh, if you were at the ground level. Uh, different, this is even goes up another 40 feet, 30 feet up above uh, in what we call the crow's nest. The, the rainforest course involves, this is the classroom, uh, morning classroom, afternoon classroom, uh, observing from t decks above the canopy. Uh, this is a, uh, an afternoon classroom uh, with an anaconda, one of our instructors here, uh, uh, sharing his enthusiasm for critters that you wouldn't normally pick up. Uh, uh, individual, uh, individualized and group instruction is very important for this program. Uh, 
the montane course is, is similarly. I mean, people think if they go to the tropics, they're going to go to the warm tropics. It isn't warm. You have to wear a parka up in the uh, Paramo and up uh, near the uh, snow-capped mountains. Uh, the cloud forest is a little bit warmer, but sometimes, as you can see, they have they, they wear their uh, wool hats to keep warm and so on. The coastal course is a program or course actually is is actually two weeks now uh, because we extended uh, some more time back in uh, Quito but it gives students an opportunity for this hands-on research uh, evening lectures on the coast obviously the opportunities to enjoy things like the Humboldt current which kind of makes you get chilly uh, go to, going to the Galapagos the Galapagos is a very unique environment as m most of you know uh, uh, it's very barren in places of volcanic islands, and but kids have lots of fun with uh, Galapagos uh, tortoises, trying to mimic their behavior. They're very slow movers, uh, and again, uh, many of the animals there are uh, very undisturbed by uh, the presence of people, uh, which makes it possible to make observations that are unprecedented anywhere else in the world. Uh, the classroom there is a and home, and the library is uh, something everybody is envious of. Uh, and sometimes you can get up close. I filmed this Galapagos hawk for about two hours on video, uh, about two meters away from it. Um, anyway, there are wonderful opportunities to study the life and uh, really what I'm trying to say here. There's a part of the component also has a Spanish language and Ecuadorian culture component to it. There are two credits for this in addition to the 16 credits of biology. Uh, we have an international research program uh, which includes many, many universities from around the world and this is probably half of them uh, that have come there and contributed to it. And to that paper I mentioned which actually documented this high biodiversity, that was made possible only through this collaborative effort to try to bring people together to understand uh, the life on Earth uh, as we see it from uh, at least this one place. Keep in mind that species don't have borders like cultures do. We don't have boundaries like state boundaries. Birds and bats and seeds, they don't respect political boundaries. And so we have to understand their life and, and how they are impacted by uh, global climate change and by other factors. Uh, the research is, goes on on chemical ecology of flowering plants from research on primate behavior and locomotion uh, to uh, camera traps that we place out. To, these are, we see animals that we would have never seen before, uh, mam mammals like this, uh, tapirs and uh, peccaries and actually seeing bats. Uh, uh, we wouldn't have seen it here unless uh, the deer had broken the beam of, the, of a light for the camera. So there are lots of things. These are also camera trap pictures. Didn't even know some of these guys existed. Uh, we can identify individuals by their spots. My friend, these are my friends here. Uh, this is the most species rich area in anywhere in the neotropics. Uh, including Mexico, uh, at any one site, one site. We have a, over 100 species of bats. Many of them are pollinators and seed dispersers, which are important for maintaining the diversity of tropical forests. I'm going to go quickly through these others. There are other kinds of research going on. Uh, just a quick glances here of research on amphibians and reptiles. One of the major challenges we face right now is the development of oil uh, and gas extraction in the, in the rainforest, which uh, some of you may know, and I don't, we can talk about this later, about uh, the current uh, effort to try to uh, uh, mitigate this by actually in, in investing in and paying off uh, the oil companies, to keeping them from, from uh, developing to preserve and protect uh, the biodiversity that exists. We have ecotourism involved. Uh, we also recently built a brand new laboratory. Uh, this was uh, a 3,000 foot laboratory funded by the National Science Foundation. So here we have this collaboration that exists between a, an Ecuadorian university, an American university, and the National Science Foundation that is enthusiastic about bringing the technology and so on to, uh, to a developing, uh, still developing country. So with that, I'll stop. Um, what can we do collectively to protect and conserve the vast wealth of biodiversity? Uh, I didn't elaborate early on, but just to point out, as I indicated, that uh, biomedicines from plants uh, are not well understood. We're losing plants and animals faster than we can find out whether they have value uh, to humankind, both in terms of uh, uh, food and fiber as well as uh, uh, medicines. So with that, uh, I'm happy to talk about this, but I know my time is short, so I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Tom. Uh, now we're going to move from uh, envir environmental issues to uh, public administration, governance, uh, the state, and then we will come back with Anitra uh, to environmental issues. Now we're going to have uh, uh, Professor uh, Enrique Sarabia from the Getulio Vargas Foundation in Brazil. Uh, uh, Enrique Sarabia is a doctor from the University of Paris, Panteon Sorbonne. He teaches at the Brazilian School of Public and Business Administration uh, at the Getulio Vargas Foundation, where he coordinates the Center for Regulatory Studies and the Center for Cultural Management. Um, he, he is one of the uh, most well-known experts on uh, governance and public administration in Latin America, and he will talk about this. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> thank you. Carlos, let me thank first to the Purdy Center and to David and to Carlos Blanco because this opportunity of staying here and trying to, to talk about what will happen with Latin America until 2060. Uh, my, my field of interest in, in this time, in recent years, is public policy. Let us say uh, how public policies are elaborated and implemented in, in real life. Secondly, I'm working with regulation, especially regulation of public services. Um, third, I work in with cultural policy and management. So my, my focus will be not economic, will be more political science, public administration, and in some sense, futurology. Uh, the first question I would say is that I try to focus on 2060. Uh, if I will speak about the present, is in order to see some trends, some tendencies, are important in order to try to explain the future. Uh, when we speak of a, of a so distant future, at least three three problems appear. The first, will planet Earth ex will exist in 2060? As Tom was saying, well, we, we could have some doubts about it. Second, uh, appear the idea of, of Keynes, this so famous and quoted Butat, the Lord Keynes, when he said that the, at the, in the long run, the only thing we know is, is that all of us will be dead. Um, third, and that is certain, if planet Earth continue, is that humankind will continue probably the same with all the virtues and vices of all of us that come since the time of the Greek philosophers going through Shakespeare, you know, Machiavelli, uh, that described very well what are the real motivation of people when they speak about power and about money. Greed, envy, from the positive point of view, uh, compassion, love, solidarity, all those characteristics of the humankind will exist and will continue being the motivators of political and economic behavior. So that's the only thing we know, or probably we know, about the future. The question is that if we are speaking about planning, about administration, we have to try to establish goals, aims in the future, Goals that are, will be in a context, which are the main trends, the main characteristics of, this, of that context in a probable future. 
Uh, one of the techniques that is very much used and very much used uh, growingly <laughs> recently is the, the technique of the theory of scenarios. Uh, there are, they, there have, be, have been some, some very interesting experiences in, in Latin America. One was in the National Bank of Social and Economic Development in Brazil uh, during the 80s tried to draft the, scenario, the Brazilian scenarios for the year 2000. Uh, they divided the, the reality in some aspect, economic, political, social, international, and technological. And after very good application of many techniques, especially Delphi technique, they established the possibility of three possible scenarios. That's for the year 2000, made in the 80s. The maintenance of the status quo, a discrete growth and some context changes, and the competitive integration of the country in the, in the international stage. Uh, after that, in, in the year 2000, it, Brazil was between those, these two possibilities, these two scenarios. No? But many institutions were prepared. You know that in scenarios, the question is to try to have a very clear strategy and try to implement that strategy in any of the possible scenarios. Well, the problem was that the public policy makers didn't take in consideration those scenarios, even they were made by, by a, a, a public institution. But many uh, organizations of the Brazilian government, as state-owned companies, as the oil company Petrobras, the energy company Petrobras, they take in consideration those scenarios for planning their own activity and for, the, for the future. Um, especially many private enterprises, even multinational, use those scenarios for their particular, the, the particular planning. So that is the, 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 first, the first question I, I, I would like to, 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 to put is the possibility of establishing scenarios. That is not a certain future. Uh, possibilities uh, and the possibility of, of strengthening the organization in order to implement the, strat the strategy in any of the possible scenarios established. The scenario planning technique considers trends and tendencies and the possibility, possibility of unforeseen or unpredicted events. That is not just to try to establish what will, what will ha happen seeing the past. It's also seeing the tendencies of the past, but also considering the possibility of other unforeseen or unpredicted events. What I'll try now is to regard some trends in recent Latin American politics and economy and try to imagine their possible developments. So which are the main trends that probably are in very present on the basis of the, 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 the Latin American countries' dynamics. The first is the contradictory but dialectical tendencies to national and regional integration and fragmentation. If we consider what happened in, in Latin America since the end of the Second World War, we will see that there were, very, there were very many attempts in order to try to congregate the countries in integration processes. You know, all of, all of them, I, I, I will not speak about them. You have ALALC, or LAFTA, Latin American Free Trade Association, that became ALADI in 1980. Afterwards, the integration of Mexico in, the, in NAFTA, and the bilateral, bilateral agreements between the United States and many, and many of the countries that belonging to other uh, uh, integration processes. That's very important because one is the, one of the causes of the fragmentation. Huh? The idea, well, we will gather efforts, but afterwards comes the temptation. The United States, mainly the United States or other countries, 
uh, proposed bilateral agreements, uh, the, 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 the countries decide they prefer to do that, and the integration processes are postponed. The Andean group, with many problems along, along his, his, long, his long life that became an Andean community, Mercosur since 1991. Mercosur that now is, will be integrated with the Andean group in the UNASUR, the union of the countries of South America. You know, that I speak in since 1960, Alalc, to, 19, to 2007, UNASUR. Integration, but all kind of failures, and the integration never goes rapidly in, in, uh, to, to achieve their aims, their projected aims. Another question that is very important to see to see about this, this tendency is the internal conflicts within the countries. Uh, problems as, for example, Bolivia in recent, in recent uh, times, but many other that happen and show the possibility of fragmentation of the countries. The indigenous peoples or nation, that's something that is a, a source of concern in many countries, especially in Brazil. The, the army, the military are very much concerned about the possibility of some kind of independence of the so-called indigenous peoples, especially those, those groups that are very close to the frontiers or sharing territory with two or three countries, the case of the Yanomamis with Venezuela, for instance. So uh, I, I have spoken with many military in Brazil and they say that they consider that in 60, 50, 60 years, Brazil will fragmentate in, 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 in other, or at least there will be some independent uh, indigenous, indigenous peoples within the territory. I don't know if that is paranoia, but it's something that in some sense you can see some, some trends in that, in that sense. So that's the, the first question. So thinking in 2000, 60. No? What will happen? <laughs> Integration, fragmentation, that is both are possible scenarios for that time. The second is the integration of Latin America to global system, especially to global governing mechanisms. Um, that's something that is happening uh, now. Uh, we, we, could consider globalization in three levels. Uh, the level of economic and fin financial systems, trade production, uh, and cooperation in their inter and intra activity. That's all that is related to economy and finances. That is probably the level where glo globalization is more clear. Second level, culture has the, the, the Patronization of the homogenization of the world yeah, through uses, customs, uh, art, music, uh, etc. And third, and that's what is interesting from, from the point of view we are analyzing now, the supranational law and institutional system that is going to the global governance. Yeah. If you see, there is a, a third level of globalization yeah, composed by agreements, pacts, international law, international organizations that is growing rapidly and is a, con a condition, is all the time, uh, all the time trying to, 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 to limit the traditional uh, national sovereignty. Uh, obviously that those, those global systems not, are not regional, are global, are universal. So that's probably one, another of the points of possible fragmentation because Latin America is linked today to global system, to, 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 to universal systems uh, that in many cases are not related to, to the neighbors or to the, to the other countries. Third, related strongly to the previous tendency, is the growing common regulation of activities and services. I put here the example of Europe. 
Europe is creating since 2003, many European regulatory authorities or agencies. You can see there for avi aviation safety, for food safety, for maritime safety, for electronic communication, telecommunications, for energy, gas, gas and electricity. So also services that because of the particular nature are regulated in common but, but the countries. If, if you think in Latin America, well, many activities uh, are, in, are of the, the, the interest are, are shared by many countries. Air and space regulation, the use of, uh, use of transportation, sea regulation, environment regulation, peace and security, telecommunication regulations, the virtual space regulation, the virtual space is growing too, and many things, many transactions happen today in the virtual space. Financial and monetary system, immigration, and so on and so forth. So there are many areas that show the necessity and the possibility of common regulation of all of, all of them. Fourth, First tendency, the difficulties and contradictions for finding a satisfactory political system. Well, all, many of our, our participants have spoken about, about it. If you consider what happened in, in, the, in, in Latin America since Second World War, you will see the permanent search for a political model. The first, during the 50s, uh, the, the 60s was the idea of development and the role of the state planning and establishing goals for all the community. Then we came the time of the military regimes. Some of them uh, continue in the same line, that is the idea of uh, the role of, of, of a strong state. Others, uh, as the case of the last military regime in Argentina, going to minimum state projects of privatization. That was the third in the 80s or in the 90s, the third, the third model. The new populist regimes, many spoke about that. And today, the Brazil, uh, Brazil formula and Chile. Chile, Brazil is creating many new political mechanisms that are very much interesting. The first was the participatory budget, not, but there are many others, I, not, I, don't, I don't have time for explaining all of them, that are very interesting and I think that is a consequence of 16 years of regular and democratic government as Brazil uh, lived uh, since, uh, since the beginning of the presidency of Fernando Henrique Cardoso. Fifth, the political and economic strengthening of some countries and the parallel weakening of others. That's other tendency, a cyclical tendency. Right? First, the outreach powers and their links. Right? Different links, huh? the United Kingdom, Britain, uh, or Europe, the United States, etc. The, uh, the Soviet Union. All those powers, the outreach powers, with their link with, with uh, some of, of the countries, uh, contributed to strength or to weaken some of the countries. You can see, for example, the, the examples of Argentina that was probably the fifth economy in, in 1910, uh, and now lived all the crises you know. Uruguay, more or less the same thing. Mexico, with all their crises and growth, and Brazil. Is the question of natural resources that is a very this is, is important question because the the, the 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 strength of the country depends, as we saw also, speaking about soybean and about all the commodities that our previous speakers spoke about. Sixth tendency, and, and, the, and the, the, the last that I wanted to speak about, the permanence of mechanisms of income concentration, growing regional imbalance, and social injustice and inequity. 
That's another, another trend, another important trend. That's probably the big concern of many of the countries of Latin America. Some of them are trying to cope with this, with this problem. Huh? But anyway, probably this, this is other those, to, the, 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 of the trends that will explain the possibilities of the Latin America in the future. Thank you. Y nos vemos en dos meses. I'm going to talk about the reform of the state and democracy in Latin America. <clears throat> With a caveat uh, that Scott made that uh, we cannot have generalizations in Latin America. So what I will say is that what uh, my, my, my presentation applies to all Latin American countries, but to the exceptions. Okay. <laughs> uh, my main concern is why so many failures in the process of reforms in Latin America. We have seen uh, what uh, Silvia presented on the judiciary, and we have uh, also discussed about many uh, failures on the process of development, and um, and I think. There is uh, uh, some deep problem about this uh, political and institutional reforms, and also economic and, and uh, other type of reforms in the region. And this failure has brought disenchantment uh, with some of these reforms. Uh, for instance, decentralization was a trend in the 1990s and now seems to be uh, halted, distorted, or slowed in many countries. I think reformers have been kind of a slaves of a variety of conceptual frameworks. For instance, we still talk about modernization. When modernity has passed, many years ago. We, we are in a postmodern world, and we are proposing modernization in many fields and regards. Also, we talk about how to gather best practices, to learn from them. And I think we need to talk about bad practices, about <laughs> failures about problems that we have been uh, having uh, in recent years. There is a conceptual framework that I think has to be changed. I'm not saying I have uh, answers to this, but I think this is one of the most important problems. And later I'm going to address some specific topics challenging Latin American future. We tend to think that Latin America has uh, a weak state with lack of institutionalization, predated by special interests and with an authoritarian-like presence. The solution, a solid state with robust uh, state institutions and good governance. The problem is that these solid states seems to be unachievable. This approach has failed because the state frame to be changed is inexistent. For instance, trying to reform the judiciary without considering the system in which it is embedded is simply not working. The suggested approach that I present here, based on works about complexity and complex associative networks, consider the state 
as a structure comprised by clusters, clusters that are formed by state networks, you know, think on Congress and the relation between the Congress and the other branches and other public offices, but also non-state actors being part of the network in which the Congress, for instance, is uh, part of. Meaning that the state actors are formed, formed, constituted by a state institution and non-state institutions at the same time. We cannot think in Congress, for instance, without thinking in public, uh, in special interests entrenched to lawmakers, to uh, the offices uh, of Congress, and the like. These clusters, public and private, uh, with public and, pri and private agents, are the real state actors, which are intertwi intertwined state and non-state agents. The clusters are mobile, fluid, evolve through time, gain and lose power, impact more or less territory, have more or less institutional density. They are within the state, ingrained, with non-state actors and some in the border of the state and even out of the state. The government is a major cluster among others, not the unique and often not the most important. The paradox is that government, governments are more important in weak states and less important in the stronger states. In Latin America, we have had uh, kind uh, of three common explanations about how, about why reforms have been slowed down or withered away. For instance, leaders have a lack of political will and therefore do not push for reforms that will make them lose political power in the short term. Or the economic boom appears to have lessened the need for profound changes. Or the reemergence of popular protest in favor of maintaining the government's central role as the main distributor of public resources. However, within this theoretical framework that I mentioned, it is possible that the difficulties experienced when attempting to reform have a more direct relationship with the weakness of state institutions. This suggests the existence of relatively weak state networks and low in the energy clusters mentioned this combination of public and non-public actors entrenched as the agents of the state. In Latin America, I think we are we have problems with the political parties. Political parties are weak. Even those old populist political parties that are now coming back, like the PRI in Mexico, the APRA in Peru, uh, well, Peronists are always there. <laughs> uh, these parties are not the same old parties, having the same names. Uh, maybe the old strong political parties that we knew in Latin American past are not going to be anymore there. Maybe what 
we can have as horizontal network parties able to assume fragmentation as a condition and not as a calamity. Interconnected with various social networks, decentralized and with high autonomy and subnational levels. This may be the destiny of these Latin American political parties. With two loose ideological commitments, move to the political center, not because they are wise, but because they lack options. By the way, this is some topic that I think is very important to address. This convergence of political parties programs, we tend to think that uh, this is because they're becoming, you know, uh, wiser and they know better the situation. And I think is that maybe the state, the structure of the state doesn't allow all these extreme uh, policies with some examples like we have seen in, in some countries in Latin America that demonstrate that they are not, these, these policies from the extremes are not viable in the long run. Public administration. Autonomy in a very specific sense may be the future of public administration structures guided by general principles designed to provide result-oriented citizen-led strategies with safeguards against corruption. The only possible control mechanism may come from the interconnection with citizens, not from other oversight agencies coming, you know, aggregating each other, uh, overlapping, but from other uh, agent, agents which will allow the public administration not only to be controlled, but converted <coughs> in a public space, at least partially, but non-state agents. The major reform of the public administration, which will define its possible future, is the expansion of networks in which citizens are involved in its design as well as with its financing, monitoring, and evaluation of the provision of services. Other issue regarding to national and subnational state powers. <coughs> this tendency to regulate special interests, to control them, to prevent them to intervening, maybe we need the other way around for two reasons, because, because first, because it's impossible to get rid of a special interest. And secondly, because it may be wiser to have no less, but more a special interest coming from different realms of the society, intertwined. If you have you know, uh, uh, an important media network, uh, with high leverage in a, in a, in a public uh, administration office, what we want to prevent that or to have more media involved, create, coming from civil society, from NGOs, and the like. More complex networks and encompassing clusters. Another problem, presidency of Latin American countries. We tend to think that the presidents are very powerful. Actually, I think they are prisoners of mythical powers. They, are, they have power to appoint several uh, hundreds or even thousands of uh, public uh, officials, but not, not much more than that. 
uh, the president give orders, but do not, but do not always govern because their orders or wishes seldom lead to expected results. That is why they have a superimposed communication structure that builds, manages, and renew hopes. On the basis of facts that are often uncontrollable, such as sudden prosperity, mainly due to favorable external shocks. That's something to think about what is happening right now in some countries in Latin America. The reform should seek to replace the precedent filled with these illusory powers for the presidency. The presidency should be responsible for initiating cascade effects whose impacts are not known or foreseeable. Therefore, efforts should be devoted to negotiating strategies that can be executed in such a way that interacting networks become denser and varied. In the ancient and traditional authoritarian regime, government was a pure command of unilateral voices. Presidential reform should move towards a more interconnected government with more limits on its specific fields, but effective in creating cascade effects that is ultimately the secret of its power. I'm going to finish with non-centralized decentralization. That's a tragedy in Latin America, that we have had decentralization in many countries, I think is the, 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 the broadest reform in the region, but uh, due to these uh, problems, became a centralized decentralization. Decentralization has been, take, has been undertaken in Latin America as a top-down shift of functions. This by dim dimensional view implies that what is down is subordinated to what is above, no matter what. A multidimensional approach rather implies a dynamic of horizontal fragmentation capable of creating autonomous networks at decentralized levels, not necessarily subsidiary to the national level. In many experiences, decentralization attempts have been, have been the micro reproduction of highly centralized upper levels with proliferation of central levels. Rather than achieving decentralization, this has created, disseminated centralism. I think this is the kind of reforms we have to pursue in Latin America. Thank you. And now, for closing remarks, Anitra Thorho. She is a research professor at Yale University is a scientist and advocate for restoring the earth who has elucidated toxic levels of pollutants and helped nations around the world set a scientific standard to eliminate a series of pollutants. Uh, currently, she is researching remote sensing of coastal tropical pollution at jail, at, at jail and serves as Chair of Physiology of American Botanical Society. It's President of the United States Club of Rome and, mem and a member of the International Club of Rome. She is author of 10 scientific books plus hundreds of scientific papers. Please, Anitra. Thank you. Uh, the USA Club of Rome has used the Barry Hughes from the Frederick S. Pardee Center in Denver, Colorado, uh, model of international futures uh, as a basis of looking at the entire Western Hemisphere, of course, which uh, Latin America is many of the 38 countries. 
and I'm going to briefly go through a uh, rapid concept of what we have looked at. We're, we're looking from the Arctic Ocean, including Greenland, down to the Antarctic, so that we <clears throat> include large amounts of ocean space, both in the Pacific and the Atlantic. And we have taken the model and the data from 2005, when we started, to 2055, which is five years short of your goal, 2060, but I don't think really shows too much uh, different trends. And we have looked at the entire system. Now, the first thing you have to understand is over the 100 million years, the air has flowed throughout the system. The waters flow from uh, the oceans flow from continent to continent. The animals and plants, as my colleague has suggested, certainly have migrated and flowed and gone from, from region to region and the people for 20,000 years since they came across the Bering Straits and probably came in from many other areas have flowed from region to region. So the, what we're looking at now are small lines put frequently during the colonial period where Europe <clears throat> was, had colonies throughout the Western Hemisphere. Uh, the uses of plant and animal species were learned from the indigenous people and include things like potatoes, squash, tobacco, etc. But I think one thing that unites us is we all came here with no infrastructure, our ancestors did. And so we see that spirit of exploration in our science, our medicine, our defense, engineering, and architecture. I want to tell you a little about the history because one of our themes is that there has been enormous variability in time, space, uh, in all parts of the hemisphere. This is Pangaea, which is 225 million years ago, where there was no North and South America. In fact, North and South America were, were completely linked to Europe and Africa, as well as Antarctica, India, and Australia. And some 25 million years later, North America began pulling away from South America, as did Australia begin pulling away, and India went and bumped into Asia and completely separated itself by 125 million in the Jurassic period, you have a definite beginning of North America, a definite beginning of South America as it begins to pull away from Africa, and you have the beginning of the Atlantic Ocean and the Caribbean Sea right here. Although Mexican's Yucatan Peninsula hasn't bumped into Mexico yet, nor has Central America emerged at this point. And the Cretaceous, you have a complete separation of South America from, from <clears throat> Africa, and you have a Atlantic Ocean forming here. And finally, uh, Central America emerges. Panama is the last link. So you have a Caribbean Sea, and you have definite north-south uh, continents, and Antarctica is completely separated. Just to see the high variability in the hemisphere and in the nations from time and space. We have a remarkable hemisphere, and if we cannot survive, if we cannot sustain here in the Western Hemisphere, then I have no idea how there's any chance for Asia, Africa, or Europe. We have 26% of the world's water for 13% of the world's people. We have three of the last primordial forests out of four in the world. Only Russia has the Siberian forest. We have the last two sustainable fisheries. And there has been almost no war except the Bolivia-Paraguay War in the 30s, brief border skirmishes between Ecuador and Peru. We've had almost 100 years of peace while Europe, Africa, Asia has had multiple wars at frequent intervals. And most, as we have just discussed, our democracies, and there has been trade between, between the regions for millennia, probably 12 millennia. Now, what will happen in this period of time? There will be enough people to repopulate the United States, 320 million people. 
We now are about 887, and we're going to close to 1.2 billion. Of course, the six largest nations, Mexico, Canada, Brazil, Peru, Argentina, and the United States are going to account for a good deal of that, but there's the three highest growth nations, which are in northern Central America, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua. They are going to account for 115 percent average growth between them, and that's 25 million. The other 29 nations are going to account for 84 percent, although Haiti, Bolivia, and Paraguay are going to have growth about 70 percent as an average, Haiti much, much higher. This is now from 1965 here on this line, 1965, there has been a logarithmic growth until today. I'm, my pointer is today. A logarithmic growth in North and South America and really a high growth in Central America. But we're looking forward to the rest of the log growth and then a stabilization and in fact a decrease in South America until the year 2100. So if you're talking 2060, it's still in the log growth phase, particularly in Central America, which is this low blue line here. And this is South America, and particularly Brazil, we see. Once more, 1965, so I'm showing you some past. And 2010 to 2060, I'm showing you the future. And this is from Barry Hughes's International Future Model at the Pardee Center in Denver. This is Central America, and you can see Guatemala, uh, Nicaragua, and uh, Honduras uh, way outstripping anybody else in their growth curve between now and 2060. Honduras being 113 percent, Guatemala 130, et cetera, Paraguay 108. Food production, what's going to happen to the people? Who will feed them? Where will they get their food from? Where will they get their water? Where will they get their protein? This is an important question. Norman Borlaug worked with us on this, but this is Barry Hughes's model. This is 1965. This is 2010 here. And this was an El Nino cyclone period where you see it highly uh, reflected in the agricultural production of Central America, which is down here, and South America, which is here. Brazil, of course, is the biggest food producer in South America, and Argentina is second, then come all the other countries. And once more, we have large food production in Costa Rica, Guatemala, Panama, and uh, El Salvador and Nicaragua here. But once more, it's highly weather dependent. Dennis Meadows, our colleague who wrote The Limits to Growth, said, the first crisis in the global situation will be a food crisis, and it will happen in 20." 25. Well, now we find out that China's having a food crisis with its inflation. Haiti had a food crisis. 30 countries around the world had a food crisis last year, all of which had to do with weather as well as the political regimes. Fish decline. It's very unfortunate that our colleague Daniel Pauly from the University of British Columbia says that the world's largest ecosystem, which is the Pacific Ocean, will run out of fish as we know it now by the year 2055. The Chinese, and this very much bears on the earlier session, the Chinese factory ships, Japanese, Russian, Portuguese, are in the Pacific mining one of the world's invisible commodities, which are the fish that are outside the territorial limits. These are not being controlled by anyone. The UN is a total failure in its UN EP, environmental protection, and the FAO is doing nothing except supporting the fisheries efforts. So we have a massive mining. There are countries like Mexico who are inviting them inside their ter territorial limits. The Atlantic fisheries is already I guess I can go backwards, or I can't go backwards. All right, the Atlantic fisheries is already, can, can I go backwards somehow? Okay, thank you. 
the Atlantic fisheries is already very overfished. As you know, many Caribbean countries, such as Haiti, have absolutely no fisheries left. Uh, Jamaica, where I taught them to restore underwater resources, does have 15,000 fishermen, and so did the Bahamas, but many of the uh, small countries in the Caribbean have no fisheries. This red shows countries that have mariculture. It is imperative that we switch to our fish production from mariculture. There is only Canada, the United States, and Chile in this hemisphere that are doing mariculture. China, despite the fact they are producing 80% of the world's maricultured fish, but they still need, because they have so outstripped their resource base, they still need to mine the Pacific Ocean. Um, water. We're going to need water to have another 350 million people. The water is very rich, particularly Brazil, Canada, Guyana. The water is not so good in some of the Central American countries and very poor in the Antilles. The water, the rain, the precipitation, as well as the very short rivers that don't retain any groundwater. Mexico has specific places of water difficulty, as does Peru. So water security is not so good on the western uh, Pacific side, and it's very good on the Atlantic side, particularly in Brazil and Canada. These are the numbers. Mexico is water deficient, whereas Central America is fairly okay. The Greater Antilles is very low, and Guyana and um, some of the Andes. Now, some of the Andes are living on water from the glacial melts, which will be finished very shortly. So water security is in Canada and Guyana, water insecurity in Mexico, Peru, Ecuador, and the Antilles. Environment. We have enormous seas. That's what's separating us from everybody else. And second, we have 26% of the world's we produce 20% of the world's oxygen from the Amazon forest alone, let alone our northern forest. The large ocean currents are providing the temperature stability of the world. If you're worried about global warming, worry about our ocean currents, because that is what is doing uh, the job of keeping the temperature stable are the oceans and the ocean currents. Critical problems of Environment are deforestation, particularly in Latin America. North America actually has more forests than it did 100 years ago. Biodiversity, fisheries depletion, uh, black, brackish and freshwater management, and climate change. I'm just showing you areas in pink and dark blue are deforestation, major <coughs> problems in Latin America and Central America. These are our regions of biodiversity challenges. There are nine specific areas in the Americas out of 25 in the world. So we have a lot of biodiversity challenges. And here is CO2, the culprit in the whole climate change, and we see it over the ABC countries in Uruguay and, and Peru, and we see it over North America, including Mexico and Canada here. These are red patches, means we have a lot of CO2. But of course, China and the Middle East and Europe have a great deal more than we do. Here's the ocean current conveyor belt that is taking the water around the world, and the deep ocean water is what is making our temperature go higher or lower. That is the conveyor belt for climate change. Now, the interaction of the 50 million indigenous people and the 308 partially indigenous people in the hemisphere who are going to become 50% more because those are the exact regions that are growing their populations at 100% or more, are with food because there's going to be high pressure on food. Soils, they're expanding into the marginal soils. They're diminishing biodiversity because they're placed exactly in the hot spots and they decimate the forests with the cooking fuel. The infant mortality, and this is 1965, has been amazing in South America, as several other speakers. This is 2011 here. This 
diminution of infant mortality is two things, vaccinations and various pharmaceutical uh, to fight bacterial and other infections. And here it is in um, Central America, but we still have very high infant mortality rates and that, as you all know, is keeping up the population growth. If we have more help to them, uh, energy. Demand far outstrips. We've got to go from the fossil fuel, coal, and petroleum, which we're now doing, into um, gas and many other kinds of renewable energies. There is massive renewable energy. Here is South America, gas fields, and if you look at the black, the black are petroleum. Venezuela, of course, is the great, uh, great resource of petroleum, but many, many countries have, have gas, including Brazil, uh, Peru, Ecuador, uh, even Trinidad and some of the small Caribbean islands. These are the renewable energy sources of um, Latin America. And the black is wind and the blue is solar. So there are many, many renewable energy sources and there are ocean energies too. No, it went off again. Okay, that's North America, which of course I'm skipping over. The reserves, Venezuela has the big gas reserves as well as the big petroleum reserves besides Canada, but Brazil has huge, Ecuador has huge gas reserves as does Bolivia. So we have lots and lots of gas as an intermediate fuel and a lot of other energy, but the demand is extremely great. This is today. This is the demand of Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, uh, and Chile. Huge demands, and this is Central America, which of course is going to have huge demands also. So critical points are we need to switch energy from coal and petroleum into gas and, and hydro, which many countries in, in the Andes are switching to hydro, as well as Central America. There's a great emphasis on the indigenous and the people in poverty in our report, particularly their poverty alleviation and their health and education, a respect for these people, and an enfranchisement and teaching them skills of reforestation, fisheries restoration, and other things. We need to mariculture and protect jointly, all of us working together, the fish in the Pacific Ocean we need to have better water management, but below the Rio Grande, 15% of the homes are sewered. We need an awareness of the individual and the industry's role in non-sustainability, each one of us. We need to deal with corruption, international rings of drugs, arms, and people. We need more hemispheric cooperation. People have touched on that. We need health care in the very poverty-stricken countries for the infants because that will cut down, the, and I think I've run out of time, and it's time for you all to go drinking, so I wouldn't want to cut into that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, let's take some questions or comments, and then go to uh -huh. celebration. Adele. Sylvia. I actually have a question for you. Uh, I was thinking of this idea of the citizens gaining, not regaining, gaining for the first time the, uh, the mission of monitoring government activity and uh, being a, an accountability body. Um, are you, how, how citizen-based are you thinking of? I mean, are you thinking of um, autonomous entities 
that do not belong necessarily belong to the state structure, but are funded by the state and regulated and so on? Or are you thinking of uh, citizens and, and groups of society, civil society taking over the role of, um, of functioning as an accountability agent in, in Latin America? Because um, I have some doubts about um, the benefits of that because state institutions are formed by citizens and uh, and there are some issues about the legitimacy of of uh, of the of citizens and state entities or autonomous entities uh, controlling monitoring and uh, and well watching uh, the state thank you uh, adil Thanks, thanks, thanks for some wonderful, wonderful uh, talks. This is both this panel and the first, and I'm sorry I missed the second one. Uh, I hope I'm misreading the mood of, but but there seems to be a sense of pessimism, uh, and and maybe I'm misreading it. But I'm comparing it. I'm thinking, you know, when you ask the question, "How are you?" Uh, the answer always is compared to whom. And so I was comparing this to our earlier work with Africa and South Asia, and I was thinking sort of. Any of those regions would die to get the type of information and numbers you're getting. You know, Anne talks about 6.7 education is really bad. The two great knowledge motors of the world are supposed to be India and China. Uh, China's education is 6.1 years of schooling. India, the great knowledge motor of the future, is 3.9. Uh, not, not just that, integration. No region outside of EU, as far as I can tell, is more integrated than Latin America. So, so I'm speaking as a non-Latin sort of Latin American here and thinking sort of, you know, how are we comparing this? You can compare yourself to someone else. You can compare yourself to where you were. Or you can compare yourself to your aspiration of where you thought you should have been, the Marilyn Brando on the waterfront, you know. I could have been a contender type sort of uh, <laughs> line. And it seems that it's the third, but, but not to rain on anyone's pessimism, but as, as, <laughs> as, as a South Asian Pakistani, I, I, I wonder if you're being too harsh on yourself. Uh, I have a question uh, 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 directed mostly to Carlos. Uh, that was a fascinating outline of an alternative conception of power and how it might be constituted and exercised. And in fact, it speaks to some of the questions earlier, Dylan's and others, about is there some other model for a political future that might not already be pre-written elsewhere. And I wonder, do you see glimpses of what you're talking about anywhere? Uh, uh, Sylvia had asked you sort of how might it be constituted in theory. Are there, and I'm talking about, I'm not talking about countries, but are there places, locations, institutions, place, you know, uh, movements where the kind of greater horizont horizontality and autonomy that you're talking about is emerging or visible? Uh, it's just a comment on, on uh, the energy supply. Um, Latin America is by far, uh, I, I include Mexico, the, the, the greenest continent at present. 40% of our electricity is renewable as compared to 10% world average. And just 8% is out of coal compared to a 48% world average. The US is 53, China is 90% coal electricity generation. The point is that if supply has to grow, and it will have to grow because of um, uh, economic growth and, and higher consumption per capita as personal disposable income increases over the next 50 years in Latin America, it will be very difficult to keep it as green as it is now. It's the contrary of what you are saying. Uh, first, because 80% of our renewables are hydropower. 
And the development of, of the river basins is, is very Ricardian in the sense that the most prolific rivers were developed first. Then it's becoming asymptotic to a maximum uh, uh, level. Then uh, assuming, uh, uh, the, the other thing is that uh, electricity consumption per capita in Latin America is very low. It's just 10% of the US. If we were to reach the US level, let's say in these 50 years, half the US level, supply in Latin America has to increase sixfold. That will not be, uh, 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 hydropower will not increase sixfold. That is impossible. At most, it could increase twofold. Then the pressure on non conventional renewables will be such that it will be impossible to, to they will ha would have to increase like 20 fold. The point I am making is that uh, to supply energy and particularly electricity necessary for growth will have to come either, and this is a debate we have to have in Latin America, uh, um, uh, from nuclear energy, which is, is uh, sustainable, uh, is not uh, pollutant, or from gas, uh, but g gas gives the impression of being clean, but uh, it generates as much CO2 as, as other fossil fuels. But the, the, the only point I want to make now is that we're starting from a very green position and, 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 and we will not be able to keep it as green as, as it is. And it's just, just to make that point because the bulk of it is coming from from a source that cannot be increased, which is hydro. That's the the only point I wanted to make. Well, the last uh, comment. Just one question to the two of you that I I didn't uh, hear about solar energy in your presentation, and nor nor in this discussion, and that well, hopefully will appear in, in the region's future, right? The exploitation of that and the research and development. Okay, I, I think we, we should start with a short comments and answer from uh, Tom. Well, <coughs> just getting back to, to the point of, of solar, just with every renewable energy source, there are unintended consequences. There's a recent series of papers that point out that solar uh, energy has a very big downside. And this is based on work that's been done out in the western part of the U.S. Um, where large solar panels are covering desert regions. Um, and, and the issue has to do with um, the po polar, these actually reflect polarized light. Um, and polarized light influences the movement of animals that affects their redistribution and alters their migratory pathways. Uh, insects, for example, use polarized light. Uh, the, the monarch butterflies that end up in Mexico every year may be totally screwed up as a consequence of these kind of things. So, I mean, I think uh, technology moves much more fast, much faster than uh, what we can understand in terms of biological impacts. And that goes for biofuels, it goes for solar, it goes for wind energy. I was surprised to see very low wind energy um, in, in uh, South America, and that's, uh, uh, th that should likely be a growing source of energy as well. But there are, again, unintended consequences there with killing um, uh, flying critters. So if we want to keep on this energy, um First of all, I think gas has been very maligned because everybody says fossil fuel, and they include coal, which has about 18,000 times more black soot, which was disregarded by the Copenhagen and the Cancun, and about 10,000 times more nitrous uh, oxide. So gas is number one, cleanest, we wouldn't have the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico if they had been drilling gas instead of oil because it would have, you know, gone up in the air. But it does have a lot less um, bad air pollutants, okay? So, and, and Latin America has a whole lot of gas, as I just showed, per, everything from Peru to Trinidad, the, the whole 
coastal basin. So I think that's what could going to be the intermediary for maybe 20 years. But then I think nuclear, but as you say, the little people are going to demand a lot more energy and the industries are going to demand a lot more energy and where are we going to get it from and, and the automobiles and vehicles in general are going to take. Now, of course, Argentina is leading the way with uh, all kinds of alternative fuels for their cars and they'll probably be manufacturing them and sending them around Latin America. So I don't know whether nuclear is going to become a big hit. It's, it's behaved pretty well in the United States and in France. Um, and the United States is now building a lot more gas and nuclear plants. So those are just my two solutions. Solar, uh, Florida had an enormous amount of solar 30 years ago during the Carter administration, and you hardly see any of it. So if, if solar were going to be an economic success at this level of price of gas and oil, um, then it would would be. So we've got to have gas being a lot higher than $4.50 or whatever it is today before solar is going to be in the competition. And as he says, there are biological problems to solar, but there are also technology problems. Uh, the manufacture of solar, which takes all kinds of heavy metals to manufacture the solar panels. Uh, is it not just in relation with the idea of some pessimistic view we, we, we were speaking about. No, no, I'm not, I'm not uh, pessimistic at, at all. Uh, even comparing with, other, with the other continents, uh, I think that many, many good things are happening in, in, in Latin America in recent years. Huh? Just to, to quote three, three examples, huh? the case of, of Chiapas in, in, in south of Mexico, the improvement of, of Chiapas was very strong in, in, in the last five, four or five years. Huh? Medellin in Colombia, huh? it's almost a miracle, the improvement of the city. Uh, the northeast in, in Brazil, huh? especially the state of Sierra. So you see, that's only from the point of view of, of poverty alleviation and distribution of income. But also, if you see the political solutions that are trying to, to be uh, implemented in, in several countries, you, you could be, you, you have reasons for being optimistic, not pessimistic. <clears throat> okay, and uh, one, two, uh, comment uh, the, the questions that were made to me. First, about uh, how uh, this involvement of citizens and in state institutions, when the citizens are represented through representatives uh, there, I think actually these state institutions that we have do not represent citizens. And that's the problem that we have in Latin America a problem of representation. And this relation of individuals with the state, isolated individuals, you know, going to knock the, the door for, for having some service, they are not citizens in, the, in, in this situation. They, they are powerless. The only way in which citizens get citizenship is participating in some instrument for collective action, whether there are NGOs, uh, religious associations, whatever, political parties. If we are talking about scenarios for the future, we cannot be pessimistic, neither optimistic. That's not part of the discussion, <laughs> because you know that's that's uh, a non uh, a pressure on the discussion that not is part of the discussion. The problem that I think we are addressing here is that we are comparing not what other countries have achieved, but to what we fight for, what we struggle for in Latin America. 
For instance, I, I was part of, some of you know, of a government, not a kleptomaniac government, that, and I was in charge of leading the decentralization process in that government in 1989. And, you know, we got something, and that was a, a wonderful development, but it reached a plateau. And so, what happens when, when, uh, when these reforms get stuck? That they, they don't continue at that level. That's a kind of reversal process, even a rotten process beneath these reforms at that level. If you don't continue with the cascade of reforms, you're going to have those processes corrupted. Uh, because when you have centralization at the national level, well, you have the president, the minister, you can accuse them, you can uh, question them. When you have centralization disseminated in the nation, there are a lot of public officials you, you cannot question, you cannot oversee. Third, uh, glimpse of, glimpses of this. In, in two opposite sense. I think crime is a major problem, as was mentioned here in Latin America. But the, this struggle coming from the state against criminals is not working. Because this war is fought against criminals and not the clusters that criminals uh, are part of. And these clusters are not, you know, just mafias or gangs or maras. These are state and non-state clusters. You don't find criminal networks without find, finding police, uh, military officials within them. And it's not about individuals. You know, just a colonel that is, you know, uh, 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 a murderer. No, it's about an organization ingrained, entrenched, that is part of a criminal process. So when you want to fight crime, you have to fight it with another cluster that can involve state and non-state actors. And on the other side, I think we, we find several uh, processes in Latin America where civil society organizations are the real uh, partners of public officials in which public administration can do, cannot do anything without resorting to these uh, NGOs or um, CSO uh, in the region. So I think there is a glimpse of this in many regards, but at the end, I think that the, the one of the most important policies that we should promote is the promotion of these organizations coming from the state. And one of the most important activities that a government can undertake is to promote these organizations. That at the end, will make uh, governance better, maybe with less government. Well, thank you. We have uh, finished uh, our panels today. Thank you for all of you coming.